The one thing that frustrated me a little yesterday is we talked about politics, but we didn't really talk about it. Um, we talked about art in a way of a, of a sort of bubble outside the real world. And when I was thinking about how to start this, I, I found a, a quote, always very useful to find a quote, from Toni Morrison, the great American novelist, who said, the best art is political, and you ought to be able to make it unequivocally political, but irrevocably beautiful at the same time. And then she said, if not political, art supports the status quo. And that, I think, is one of the key questions here. So the first thing I'm just to ask Robin is whether you think that's true or whether that's a, just another party pre comment from an artist who wants to get attention. Whether it's true that the best art is political? Is that, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've actually been struck by this moment we're living through where people have often asked, you know, do we see uh, the, this incredible political moment we're living through in the United States, which is also reflected around the world with other kind of nationalist tendencies, um, whether we see that reflected in the art. Um, and I'm, I'm always amazed by, you know, to some extent, that's, it's always possible to find that, but you don't necessarily see, you know, a whole kind of outpouring of artistic expression in response the way one might expect. Um, and another kind of counterintuitive thing that I've been struck by is that the, the art market seems almost immune to what's happening in the world. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's part of the problem, isn't it? Or, or, I mean, does it live in this elite world somehow outside of politics? I think it does sort of speak to this 1% aspect that, um, you know, some people actually have alluded to here, which is, um, as, de as democratic as we might want to think of uh, the art world as, as being, the, where the buying is taking place is really um, among a very rarefied group of people. And so there's always a question, like when Trump was elected, how were the auctions going to respond? Were people going to be different um, in terms of their buying? There was a lot of uncertainty, which clearly the uh, financial world has never really lo likes an uncertainty. There was a lot of questions about whether Trump's tax policies, which were un undetermined, were going to make people sort of reluctant to bid. But sure enough, it was just a very strong round mm -hmm. of sales nevertheless. And similarly, when Brexit happened, um, there was a lot of question about how that was going to affect sales in London, and it kind of didn't. Um, and similarly with 9-11, I mean, somehow the art world just seems to somewhat coast yeah. above it. Yeah, I, I remember being in New York for the, one of the big crashes, right? And um, everyone was very anxious about what it would do to the art market. And everything seemed to enhance it somehow. So, so Matthew, when you as an editor and actually someone pretty new to the times, when, when you think about what to assign, how important is the news quality or the political quality of the cultural aspects? For me, it's very yeah. important. And I think for a general interest newspaper, it is always important mm -hmm. to look at what are the big stories that are making the news agenda and what are the culture stories that can help you tell those bigger mm -hmm. Uh, stories, because I think you can, I mean, you know, you can look at uh, something like, you know, the election of Donald Trump or the rise of uh, right-wing nationalist parties uh, in Europe, and you can tell that in a particular way, who are the players, what are their policies, that sort of thing. But actually, to get a more uh, human understanding of what these things mean, I think stories from the arts and culture can be a really good way uh, to do that. But I think, also, I mean, we're talking about politics in the sense of big politics, economics, you know, how voters uh, vote, those sorts of things. But I, and, uh, and I don't really feel that there is a lot of engagement, particularly from the visual arts, with those big sort of political questions. But there's also another sort of politics, which I think is all over art at the moment. That's a sort of more personal politics, the politics of identity. Mm -hmm. They are still political questions. Well, this is, this is a very important point, because I sometimes think, you know, America I know it's a global world, but I think of America's, you know, it has its own issues of race, for instance. I mean, when I think of someone like Kara Walker, I mean, she's not a European figure. And, mm -hmm. and, and some of the great controversies in America, you know, that this paper's written about, um, the scaffolding thing at 
at the Walker Art Center. I mean, it's all about somehow, you know, race, identity, and yet in Europe, right? I mean, one has the backlash in a different way. Mm. I mean, I, I think I'm just there, very, I mean, sorry, go ahead. I mean, there are, uh, Similarly, I mean, there are, um, at the moment, in France, um, uh, there, you know, artists like Mohamed Bourissard, there's, uh, you know, there are all sorts of um, French artists of colour who were formerly sort of shut out of the art world, who are now making themselves known. Um, Labena Hamid, a British artist, mm -hmm. she won the Turner Prize uh, last year. So I think that it's, I mean, it's not just a sort of American phenomenon. I think it is also happening in, uh, in Europe as well, where, um, where artists want to engage directly with personal political questions to do with mm -hmm. race, to do with sexuality, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Yeah. No, because one of the things that also strikes me is here we are in Berlin, which we haven't really talked very much about. I mean, people have always joked about Germany, it has much too much history to digest. <laughs> um, and that is certainly true. And even last night, we were in this marvelous German historical museum, right next to uh, Schinkel's Watch Tower, you know, which I remember in 81 under the East Germans was the, had a permanent um, gas light and had a guard that marched back and forth and it was to the unknown soldier. And now it's been transformed with this wonderful Kate Kolwitz sculpture inside. Um, no gas, no light, just to the victims of totalitarianism. So somehow, you know, it's, I'm also very struck by the way art is used as propaganda, right? I mean, even as you walk around Berlin, there are these little stumbling stones mm -hmm. in the sidewalks, which began as an art project. They're little brass cobblestones, and they, they tell you which Jewish families their names, the dates they were taken away, where they died and when. And they're, in the, they're in, in the pavements, in the sidewalks, as a kind of permanent memory to make you stumble a bit over history. Now, is this art? Is this politics? Robin, what do you think? Well, but when I w I'm interested by what you're saying, that, that you don't think identity politics plays a role in Europe the way it does in New York in terms of informing creativity. It's a, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a different kind of politics because Europe is struggling with Islam in a way that the United States is, is not. Um, Europe isn't struggling so much with, I mean, it doesn't have the slavery question, right? It doesn't have the American Indian question, it has other questions, but for the most part, these are only a beginning to emerge into art mm -hmm. here, it seems to me, while in America, it's been quite a long thread. So. I'm just curious, I mean, when you decide what to write about, I mean, how, you know, how important are, are these things? And, and, and do you think that the Times itself is beginning to kind of really cover, to be a global newspaper culturally as well, which it really hadn't been for quite a long time? Yes, I mean, I, I, f I feel as if there happens to have been this moment where of kind of critical mass of events that have made this feel as if museums are wrestling with their own politics in a way they haven't had to perhaps in the past. And for the first time, for example, I did a piece um, in looking at the director of the Queens Museum who was sort of tweeting um, about uh, DACA, the, the immigration policy involving young people and she was very outspoken uh, protesting Trump's policies and she also closed her museum on inauguration day sort of in protest and there was some question about whether or not that's an appropriate role for a museum director to take you know how neutral should you be on the issues like this how much should you allow for a diversity of opinion uh, how clear should you be about your own allegiances um, and she ended up kind of clashing with the board. She ended up being fired, um, arguably for other, re other reasons. Um, but that was an issue, and that seems to have, that sort of dove seemed to dovetail with the Walker example, mm -hmm. where you know the director also came under had, some criticism. And here in Europe, I think also those issues are 
sort of particularly fraught because, of course, most museums are state-funded and they're dependent on, on often the, you know, the state that they're criticizing uh, for, for the money. So I think it creates here, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's loads of examples of that uh, sort of thing happening There is, and, there, and well. in the U.S., they're taxpayer-funded often, and right. so to some extent, these are public institutions. So, um, so I, mean, I mean, do you feel that, I mean, call it political correctness, call it whatever you like, I mean, is it more powerful in the art world now? I mean, because you, you, you just described two instances where people have taken, frankly, not very sophisticated political stands, but, but, but political stands have been, and have been fired. Right, except for example, but another example is MoMA rehung some of its permanent collection in reaction to the uh, travel ban. Um, so they sort of felt a certain kind of responsibility to respond to the political moment quite quickly. Um, and, you know, when the Whitney in its biennial had this Emmett Till installation where there were protests, um, the Whitney's, the way the Whitney decided to handle that was to stand by its exhibition, to keep it up, but in a way to kind of create a dialogue around it, to allow someone to stand in front of that painting all day and, and kind of have a, a demonstration. Um, um, what I think is interesting is that a lot of these sort of interventions and actions are actually coming from curators and other people in the art world and not so much from the artists themselves. This is on the big political questions rather than more identity mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things like, uh, like you're talking about, uh, curators speaking out, um, cur curatorial interventions, letters in newspapers, those sorts of things which are coming from a much more sort of uh, broader spectrum of the art world, not from the artists themselves. But in terms of the actual engagement with the big issues of the day that you would read about in the newspaper, it's not real. I don't really see it in the art. Yeah, I mean, it takes a while to percolate yes. through. I it think does. I think this sort of like CNN-style mm -hmm. rapid response, you know, right. is usually quite true. bad art. Um, but I just don't feel that the that the moment has come where you know someone ha is making, you know, art that really d deals in a in a way that will be remembered for the ages about the right. about the populist moment right. that we're in right. now, or about Brexit, or about what does it mean for America that 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 Trump is there. I don't think it's. I just don't think it's there yeah. yet. No, I mean, this is part of what's interesting, because the other thing I'm very struck by in Berlin, which was divided, I mean, is art is propaganda. I mean, in the museum last night, I don't know how, how many of you saw it, but there was a big Lenin statue in the courtyard, and I lived in Moscow in those days, and, and um, that Lenin, I, there were lots of Lenins all over the country. This was the Lenin bellying up to the bar pose, yeah. pose right? And you, you know, it was there as an artifact, right? But um, how much do you try when you assign or when you write to try to distinguish between art that's for the moment, arts for propaganda, um, and, and art that's really creative? Because to some degree, what's impressive about art under totalitarian systems is how powerful it has been as a way of, of mocking authority, even if it's not great art. I mean, when, when you look at Weibo, I'd, I'd love to see someone put on the internet all the memes on Weibo that have been banned because somehow, like Winnie the Pooh, as, yeah. as a meme, you know, with the honeypot for Xi Jinping, um, that's totally a story that we should be doing. We're not, I mean, as an editor, my job is not to determine what is good art and what mm -hmm. is bad art. It's what is the art that it will be productive for people to think and talk about, and mm -hmm. that includes bad art as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I don't think it's a, it's not a question of taste or of distinction. Mm -hmm. I think it's about how can it inform a conversation, how can it move people's understanding of a topical issue forward, mm -hmm. uh, rather than saying, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I love this artist, like, you know, I think we should put them in the paper. I, I mean, some, some people do that, but that's not my approach to it uh, at all. And I think that, it, that in particularly for a general interest newspaper, um, uh, that's the right approach to take. Yeah. I think perhaps in specialist art publications or whatever, there can be a different approach, but I, I, I think for a paper like ours, uh, it, it's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd I'd like to leave some time for you to ask questions, so think of some. And, and, but, but before that, Robin, one of the things I remember as an editor being very much struggling with, which is, you know, we cover culture. I mean, we treat it as news, 
it's a business, so partly we treat it as a business. The confusion of art and business is a long topic, but how much of, of what we do, do you think, is, isn't really news, but it's a kind of advertising? I mean, it, what's hard is we are constantly being pitched. I mean, I get 100 emails a day of, you know, please cover this or that. And what I often say is, you know, I cannot be part of your promotional campaign to talk about this. There needs to be some kind of raison d'etre, you know, from a news perspective. This either has to speak to something larger that I feel is worth covering, um, in which case you'll be one example of that, or if, some, if there is just sort of news value in terms of its being innovative and a, you know, a or first. Or an interesting person or right. history. But I yeah. do feel like th you cannot deny that to some extent we set the agenda and you have to be conscious of that responsibility and the weight you bring to something. Um, part of, for example, this whole rethinking of the canon, which there's going to be a panel about, I feel is very much a, a, an issue of the moment, which is, you know, to what extent there are gaps in these museum collections that now are very consciously being filled. Um, it, it fascinated me, for example, that when that Basquiat sold for a huge amount of money, it turned out Ma, there is no Basquiat in, Ma, in MoMA's collection. They, they missed him entirely um, in that moment. And I happened to be meeting with uh, the deputy curator, um, deputy chief curator, Scott Rothkoff at the Whitney, and he was talking about having gone to a Ford Foundation um, symposium about Latin X art, which is basically the gender neutral term for Latin, uh, for art made by artists of Latin American descent. And I felt like it's important to do a story about that. It's that was important. fascinating and story. And so that was in yeah. our special section yeah. here. Um, and I'm doing a piece on Adam Pendleton now, who's an African-American artist. And, and I feel as if, if, if we can turn the spotlight on those people who might not be as obvious as the Jeff Koonses of the world, that's an important role that we can play. Yeah, it's good because, you know, critics have a particular role. I mean, they're, they're the screen, supposedly, you, you know, to tell us what's worth seeing, what's worth reading, what isn't, what's interesting, what's not interesting. But coverage, news coverage is in, in a way more complicated because you don't have an obligation to cover everything. That's and you right. can't either. Nor, nor can you. And one of the things Matthew's done, which I've been very pleased with, is that for a long time our, our European coverage was really a romance language coverage. And um, it's interesting to be here in Germany because we've begun to cover the German-speaking world better than we've done in a very long time. Um, and I hope we'll do a bit more with Russia and with the Middle East also. So, it, do we have some questions out in the audience? There's a gentleman right here, first hand I saw. And there's another woman there. So let's get both, both questions at the same time, please. Hi, good morning. Um, and, and could you identify yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Flavio Del Monte uh, from Milan, uh, Massimo de Carlos Gallery. Um, curious to understand how the New York Times negotiates between the New York centricity of the art world and its global uh, extension. That's a good question. Let's, let's, let's get this um, lady here and identify yourself again, thanks. Susan Barrett, is this on? Um, Susan Barrett, I'm from St. Louis, and I have a similar question, except instead of globally, it would be regionally, um, in terms of the stories that are covered that aren't market art. I'm being from St. Louis, um, most of the art being made is in a post-Ferguson uh, world that we deal with every day, both in terms of institutions and the art being made. Okay. Do you want to... Um, yeah, well, so I think, I mean, um, there's always going to be more coverage of what's happening in New York in the arts than elsewhere in the world because it is the New York Times and historically it is the paper of that city. Uh, but of course, readers there and readers in the West of the world want to be informed about what is, uh, what is going on uh, uh, elsewhere. So uh, I don't think you, we will ever get to a situation where there's more international coverage in the Times vis-a-vis -vis the arts than, than there is in New York. It's just the, the reality of the type of newspaper that we are. Uh, but we are investing very heavily 
heavily and expanding into international arts coverage. And I think you know you'll see that there's a lot more from uh, from Europe at the moment, but there are other areas in which uh, you know which we're we're looking at uh, the, the feasibility of doing more in in Asia, in Latin America. Um, but at the moment, the, the, the appetite from the audience is mostly for what's happening in America and uh, and in Europe. I Rather think, and part of the issue is, you know, inevitably, the art centers of the world get more attention. Um, New York, London, um, also places where we have bureaus, for example, where people are based on a regular basis. And that's part of the, uh, the challenge for our national coverage, which is we have these national reporters in bureaus all over the country, but they're covering everything. So if there's a flood or a hurricane, that's usually going to trump cultural coverage. And cultural coverage is not necessarily a priority for people who are you know, covering Atlanta, covering Seattle. Um, so we, it is more difficult. Um, we have, it, it kind of depends on the correspondent. If they, you know, for example, our Chicago correspondent has had an interest in culture, so you know, she's likely to, to do a cultural story. Um, but I would say that so, it's so important to the Times now to have an international angle and a, to be looking at all of our stories with a, with a broader lens and to take it out of New York. We've actually de-emphasized our New York-focused coverage generally. Um, if a story has national impact or international impact, even better. We still kind of care about page one for those of us who grew up in print. Um, and a page one story is much, much more likely to get out front, as we, as we say, if there is sort of an international aspect to it. Yeah, that's good. I mean, cer certainly one of the things, um, having, God knows, been at that paper for 30 years, um, we are really a digital product now, mm -hmm. and we're pretty saturated in, uh, in, in the United States. You know, we're pushing, can but we, our future is digital subscriptions. Um, and the important part of digital subscriptions is to be attractive to people all over the world who can read English, who have an interest in our take, not just on Trump, but our take on um, matters close to their heart. And that includes culture, too, which is a big part of our human experience. So at least that's the end of my, my own propaganda. There's a question there. A gentleman, could, could you stand up so they can find you? Thanks. Uh, Edward, Edward Chella from Los Angeles. I'm a gallerist. Um, you know, today's and yesterday's proceedings is, 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 is as exquisite and um, educational as they've been for the audience. I'm very curious about you individually as, as reporters, but also uh, as the New York Times as a company. What is it that these proceedings are um, bringing to you individually and to the company as a whole? Because this is part of a typology of of experiences that you're curating across the world in different departments and different kinds of economic centers. And I'm curious what that is about. Okay, is, is there another question right in front there, sir? And then one more in, in the back, and then we'll go back to the panel. Benjamin Juarez from uh, Boston University. Um, I've recently seen in Europe uh, a phenomenon like uh, Martin Roth working in, in London, uh, Nicholas McGigan work in Berlin, the same thing goes for performing arts, where there was a cultural fluidity between uh, different countries in the European Union. I see that changing now. What's your perspective? Thank you. And then there was a question. Yes, uh, please. Um, Christoph Heinrich, um, director of the Denver Art Museum, medium-sized museum in the Wild West, actually German. Um, I, I wonder what I see in the United States since about a year and a half is that a lot of museums are really trying to make statements through their programs. And I'm not talking about Twitters and white noise, I'm really talking about um, shows about the refugee photography of Fazal Sheikh, or actually a lot of shows about women, 19th century, 20th century shows. Do you see a change really in programs that museums are um, launching? And usually museum programs tend to be a little longer in the planning over the last two years that make them more relevant and that could really be seen as a statement or is that maybe just my Thank own perception? You. Very, great 
Robin, do you want to start? Yeah, I would, I would start with the, with the first question in terms of what we get out of it. I mean, that is something that kind of in, going into this and in terms of planning this conference, I, I, it really mattered to me that this be substantive, that, that all of you as participants get something out of it, just you know, partly from being around each other and talking, but also by putting people up here who you know, might sort of create some sparks, um, th that kind of cross-pollination that I feel like is important and doesn't happen all that often. For me, I, I found like, for example, yesterday, two themes that, that, that were, I was left with at the end of the day were sort of hearing uh, Mark Limpshire from Pace Gallery talk about how he had to bring the gallery to the people in a way, to the collectors in San Francisco, um, in Palo Alto specifically, resonating with Michael Govan of LACMA at the end of the day, talking about bringing the museum to sort of the inner city. And that idea of you can't just sort of sit back passively as an institution, um, which is something that even, you know, kind of resonates for us at the New York Times, where we are going after readers in a more active way, that you can't just sort of rest on your laurels, um, have this sort of sense of, you know, either the, being the ivory tower or we're an authority, people are going to come to us. Um, that more proactive stance I feel like that's an interesting theme to have emerged. Um, and so those are the kinds of things, you know, we're looking for. And also, to be honest, live journalism is a whole new frontier for us. We've done Facebook Lives. We have a lot more of a video um, kind of element, if you see through our website now. We're always thinking about how people are going to look at our stories on their phones. So I don't need to tell you we're living in a whole new age. That is, there are just different ways to experience journalism besides the 800-word story, uh, story in print. And just uh, to the gentleman asking about um, changes in, in curatorial approaches, I think we haven't seen them yet, but I think it, very soon we're going to start seeing them. Because if you think about how long it takes you to plan an exhibition, they're all about two or three years out, sometimes out, up to four. So I think that all of the curatorial decisions that have been made in reaction to the big events of the past two and three years, I think we're just about to start seeing them rolling out now, and I think that would be very exciting, and actually. And actually, as a segue to our next panel, I mean, so much of why we wanted this next panel was, for example, Anne Temkin at MoMA has really taken on, you know, we need to look at the women in our collection, we need to have more female artists, not just in sort of a revisionist way, but in, in, in you know, what really sort of deserves to be in the canon and, and what did we leave out for you know, reasons of just kind of historical um, ignorance. Mm -hmm.